French flagship Orient, July 1st, 1798. Napoleon Bonaparte stands in front of his troops. He reveals that within hours, they will land in Egypt. Soon, he says, they will defeat the Mameluk sultans, then they will stay as an occupying force. The people amongst whom we're going to live are Muslims, he says, their first article of faith being this, there is but one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Do not contradict them. He then reminds the army that their forerunners, the Roman legions, protected all religions. He insists that Egyptian Muslims be treated with the same respect the army has shown Christians and Jews, and that their rituals, mosques, and priests are not to be interfered with. And soldiers must accommodate Muslim ways, even though their treatment of women differs from Europe. Now, the first town we shall come to was built by Alexander, he says, suggesting that they'll emulate the great conqueror's success. But, um, and I hate to do this at the beginning of the series, spoiler alert, they're not gonna. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well-fed on a historically busy schedule. The French invasion of Egypt in 1798 is sometimes treated like a sideshow in the Napoleonic Wars, just one of many rungs in a ladder that helped Napoleon to power while inventing Egyptology as a byproduct. But this view is vastly underselling it as an event, especially since it centers on how it impacted Europe rather than a wider picture of how it also affected North Africa and the Middle East. This was the first time since the Crusades that European armies had invaded the region, and this time they came armed with vastly superior weapons technology and an intention to bring Enlightenment ideals in order to liberate the people there. In other words, it's not only frequently cited as the first modern colonialist project, it will also set some patterns that will look all too familiar to the more modern Western interventions in the Middle East. During his invasion, Napoleon would try to secure his hold by removing an unpopular regime, installing allies, appealing to religious commonalities, and exploiting ethnic, religious, and political division for his own benefit. Now, of course, I hear you asking, is this gonna get cringe? To which I will respond with a resounding, oh yeah. I'm talking like Napoleon wearing a turban proclaiming himself a champion of Islam and wanting to unite all Muslim nations under one banner level of cringe. We'll, um, we'll get there. But right now, it's May 1798, and troops are flooding into the French Mediterranean port of Toulon. There are 40,000 soldiers in the harbor, 27 fighting ships, 400 transports, and a dozen generals. Some of the most famous commanders in France are here. The swashbuckling Caribbean raised Thomas Alexandre Dumas. The former nobleman and revolutionary Jacques-Francois Minois, who'd kept international security for France for half a decade. The hero of the revolution Jean-Baptiste Clébert, known for stubbornly holding out against royalist forces and none of them know where they're going. Some suppose it's an attempt to kick Admiral Nelson of Britain's Royal Navy out of the Mediterranean, though others say they'll sail through Gibraltar and commence the long-rumored invasion of England. Though neither of those ideas really make sense, this force is too small to invade Britain, and their company includes a delegation of 151 savants, mathematicians, chemists, linguists, and masters of natural science who seem to think they're about to study a mysterious new land. Meh, no matter. Wherever they go, they're gonna win. For Napoleon leads them. But just so we can all catch up, who exactly is this mathematician turned artillery officer? Napoleon Bonaparte had risen to prominence in France by playing a key role in the uprising of 1795, when a royalist force had tried to enter Paris during a constitutional convention and seize control of the government. Napoleon had saved the day, slaughtering the incoming royalists with cannons, while the politicians tried to figure out a government that would prove stable enough to endure while also preserving the revolution's ideals. The resulting government was a five-member committee called the Directory, and Bonaparte was their new favorite hero. As Napoleon's star ascended, he gained wealth, married a woman with powerful political connections, and gained command of the war in Italy. Within months, he'd broken the years-long stagnation there, soon secured an Austrian withdrawal, made war on the Pope, and smashed the Papal States. But by 1798, he was already thinking about what to do next. And honestly, so was the Directory, who was increasingly alarmed by this 28-year-old wonder kid. Napoleon was ruthless, competent, and ambitious, with an inherent knack of self-aggrandizing propaganda. He'd also further enriched himself looting the treasures of Italy, meaning that the Caesar comparisons were getting real uncomfortable. Now, they wanted him to invade England, you know, getting him as far from the capital as possible, but Napoleon was dubious whether that would work. Instead, he proposed to capture Egypt. See, Egypt presented an indirect path toward attacking Britain, while British ship traffic to India went around Africa. Message traffic went overland across Egypt to the Red Sea. 
And with that route conquered, French forces could link up with France's ally the Tibu Sultan, who was at this time bedeviling the East India Company forces on the subcontinent. Napoleon also argued that sugar production in the region could take the place of France's loss of Haiti, which you can watch our series on here, and it could open new avenues of trade. Besides, they could tear down the Mameluke sultans, who had oppressed French traders living in the area, and bring the liberty of the revolution to this backwards land. But honestly, there was also a more romantic reason. Enlightenment thinkers were students of the classical world, raised on the stories of the Greeks, Romans, and Pharaohs. As the most ancient of the classical empires, Egypt was considered the cradle of civilization. Yet it was also still mysterious, remaining largely unknown in Europe with an ancient language that hadn't been deciphered. I mean, what treasures might lie there? What discoveries? And in conquering it, Napoleon would be reenacting the campaigns of Alexander the Great, of Caesar, even of the great French crusader kings of the medieval era. Look, I know how silly that all sounds, but it's important to note that Napoleon and his officers were dead serious about this. In fact, once they left port and he informed them of their destination, the shipboard philosophical debate group he formed to pass the time argued at length about who they resembled the most. Were they more like the Roman legions or Alexander's Macedonians? Ooh, how about Caesar or Octavian? And when they arrived, would each become a Mark Antony with a beautiful Cleopatra-like Egyptian lover? Oh boy. Now, all self-aggrandizing fanfic aside, these sessions actually did help cut the tension because this voyage was a dangerous one. Nelson's fleet was hunting for them, and the French only slipped by through sailing at night. Their lights doused, and crew told to keep quiet. First, they made the island of Malta, gateway to Egypt, and still garrisoned by the medieval knights of Malta. Napoleon took it with minimal resistance. Since the revolution, religious contributions to the order had dried up, and half of the knights were Frenchmen who were unwilling to fight their countrymen. The Grand Master was bought off, and Napoleon stopped long enough to recruit Arabic speakers to serve as translators and intermediaries. Then, July 1st, they arrived off Alexandria, and Napoleon gave the address we quoted at the top of this episode, instructing his men how to behave amongst the Egyptians and reminding them that they're entering a city founded by Alexander. They attacked the walls that night, following a short negotiation. In a paltry defense, 500 Mameluke soldiers with century-old muskets tried to guard a medieval wall against 4,000 of Napoleon's modern infantry. The Mameluke fire was so ineffective that when General Kleber was shot in the forehead, the bullet failed to kill him. The Mamelukes fled, and as light dawned, the French found themselves in possession of the great city of Alexandria. Scholars and officers flooded in to see the Jewel of the Ptolemies, to witness the abode of Cleopatra, full of ancient splendor, and wait, what the f*** is this? This is Alexandria? Are you sure? Where are the palaces and temples and gold and incense and crap? Okay, there's Pompey's Column there. Oh, and an obelisk to Cleopatra, and wait, is that it? Hold on, are those guys using a broken obelisk as a bench? Is this hieroglyphic slab holding up a doorway? Why is everyone in rags? What happened to this place? The French were absolutely shocked. All they could fathom was that the Egyptians had forgotten their heritage, lost their status as the heirs of the classical legacy, and didn't take care of it. A diagnosis Enlightenment thinkers also ascribed to the Greeks, by the way. But the truth was, Alexandria was just old. Lots had happened in the 2,000 years since Cleopatra and Antony, after all. The course of the Nile changed, devaluing the city as a center of trade. Monuments had suffered the ravages of time, much like Roman buildings in France and Britain. Stones got reused in construction. The whole place had never recovered from its depopulation during the Black Death. And Egypt, semi-autonomous under the Mamelukes, was one of the poorest parts of the Ottoman Empire. Napoleon had just arrived, and already Egypt was not what he expected. But surely things would be different in Cairo. French ships began to unload the instruments of war. Cannons, gunpowder, an Arabic printing press to distribute propaganda, and a mobile chemistry lab for the savants to explore and categorize this new land. Everything they would need for a successful campaign. Except for the one thing they didn't bring. Canteens. Hmm. Which turns out would be pretty important where they're going. I mean, it's not like they were able to order a bunch of nourishing beverages or tasty meals and then have them shipped directly to their location. That could never happen. Back then, I mean. Thanks, Factor. 
Now, y'all know how much I love to cook, but I really only have time to do that on the weekends these days. Ooh, and I'll see you then, HelloFresh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but during the week, I never have time to make meals from scratch. So what am I supposed to do, right? Frozen meals have too many preservatives and taste like Garbo. And of course, my bank account lives in constant fear of my takeout orders. So my go-to solution for a while now has been Factor, which is this awesome ready-to-eat meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Every meal is ready in two minutes with no prep and no mess, just good dang food right when I need it. Factor also gives you just a ton of meal options to choose from to achieve any nutritional goals you may have. They got everything from keto, veggie, protein plus, vegan options, calorie smart, which is meals I think that are 550 calories or less, and a ton more, all of which you can choose from from their just delectable rotating weekly menu. I like to do it on Sundays because it locks it in and I can get it midweek. And actually, you can even mix and match between all of those types of meals to ensure that everyone in your household gets the exact type of food that they love fast. And having just gotten back from a week of eating crappy conference food, I was pumped to come home to a fridge full of meals I was actually excited to eat, like the shredded chicken taco bowl. It's one of my absolute go-tos, and it just reminded me how happy I was to be home. Plus, it was so fast, it got me a little extra couch co-op time with Zoe. That is, of course, code for scratches. So this spring, if you want to eat better while also just being better with your time, all you gotta do is head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first factor box. And when you do, not only will you be joining me in getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle, but you'll also be helping to directly support the content that you love. Oh, and while I'm sure by now you are sick of me talking about their smoothies, that's actually too bad. They are amazing, and I will shout it from the digital rooftop! Digital rooftop. Digital rooftop. Oh, don't get jealous, HelloFresh. Again, that's 50% off your first box at factor75.com using that code extra credits 50. Thank you so much in advance, and we'll see you all next time. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding.